So does this sound familiar? I tested my child the day before and they got everything correct, yet they failed the test or exam. Here's another one. Mom, there were questions in the exam that I was never taught. <laughs> the laughter says yes. Everyone said it was a hard paper. In fact, I heard that from my tricks about the aloe paper. The chances are, ladies and gentlemen, that your child did get everything correct at home while you were testing them. But you were testing them at the incorrect cognitive levels and what you tested them only constituted 30 or 40 percent of what was in the exam. So they got everything right that you taught them, but you didn't teach them everything. If the teachers are constructing their exams and tests correctly, there will be questions that they've never seen before. They will be required to demonstrate their knowledge in a way that they've never had to apply it before. That's very important and it's part of what we want from our students. And finally, exam papers should be hard. That's how you know that they're very well constructed and that they have a good standard. If they were easy, everyone would be getting the A's. So the first thing you wish you'd known sooner was cognitive levels. And it's not, not some obscure reference to how intelligent we are. It's about how we are required to demonstrate our engagement with different information and skill that varies. So the first thing you wish you'd known for, sooner was cognitive levels and how they've been tested. And more, more importantly, why they are being tested. So a commonly used taxonomy for cognitive levels is Bloom's taxonomy. There are many out there. And essentially, the definition of a taxonomy is a scheme of classification. For our purposes, we're going to look at it being more about a framework of thinking and more a framework of how we think and how we can test that we are thinking correctly. So this is important because as parents, educators, employees, we want our students to think out the box. I've heard that from nearly every single parent in my office. The expectation is that our learners or our kids are going to think critically and that we are going to think creatively and be problem solvers. Every single one of those requirements that you have of your children, that your employees have of your children, when they are going to graduate or go to into the workplace, that universities are going to have of your children, are all higher cognitive order thinking. And it's not something that comes naturally, it's something that has to be taught. In fact, exactly what we've just spoken about now, has been they've been identified as some of the most critical skills that people need to operate in the 21st century. The most sought after skills in employment and in the world. So Bloom's taxonomy, there are many others, but this is one that is referenced in a lot of teaching manuals. It's probably the most commonly used one and it's quite user friendly. And I'm going to have to break it down a little bit and give it some context. This is a very simplified version of it. And we start at the bottom with cognitive level one, which is remembering and recognizing facts. Cognitive level number two is understanding and understanding what the facts mean. Cognitive level number one and two are considered lower order thinking skills. The next four cognitive levels, apply, analyze, evaluate and create, are considered higher order cognitive skills. Now, we use the CAPS document as a basis for understanding cognitive levels and they've simplified it a little bit easier in terms of how we structure our exams and our tests and how we engage with that information. And they've said cognitive level one is the first two cognitive levels of Bloom's taxonomy. So when I'm referring to cognitive level one from now onwards, I'm referring to the first two. Analyze and apply are cognitive level number two and create and evaluate our cognitive level number three. 
Okay. What do you suppose those percentages mean that I've just added to the slide? To your mark? To your exam construction? Yes, Gareth? So, in most exams, between 30 and 40 percent of the exam is cognitive level one. I helped my child and they knew everything when I went to school. They got 40 percent for the exam, which meant they got 100 percent for everything that you taught them at home. Cognitive level two makes up 30 to 40 percent and cognitive level three makes up the other 30 plus minus 30 percent. And why I say plus minus it varies from subject to subject and the IEB places a higher it has weighted it more to the higher cognitive levels and often their papers are cognitive level 3 is sitting at about 40 percent. To make it a little bit more accessible I've given four possible types of questions and I think what's important to know in terms of understanding what cognitive level you're required to demonstrate engage with the knowledge is to look at the verbs, the doing words and the instructions that are embedded in the question. So can you list three things? What is the key word in that? List. So if it says list, basic cognitive level, how would you explain? What's the key instruction or verb in that? Explain. What facts or ideas show? To show. How would you compare? Compare. Cognitive level number three. How would you use? Which word is it? Use. Use the information. How would you organize? Organize. What conclusions can you draw? Draw conclusions. What do you think? Are they really asking you what you think? Think? Can you make it up as you're going along? You can try, but you're not going to get the marks you're looking for. What they want to see is that you can paraphrase the information. In other words, use it in your own words. Now the last one. What would happen if? What is the key word thing, the phrase we're looking for here? Yes. Happen if. They ask you to use information and project an outcome. How would you adapt? Adapt. Adapt itself is changing and using information in a different way. Would it be better if? Evaluate. Comment on. How, would, how could you determine? Determine. So in other words, look at the information and apply a critical analysis of it. This is just a tip of the iceberg. If you go onto the Edging website under resources, there's Bloom's Taxonomy for Teachers, which will detail a lot more of the keywords and the questions that allow you to access the information. So a point to consider. NSE, National Senior Certificate Pass, has been between 30 and 40 percent. What is it telling you about what they're expecting the learners to be able to do? Learn and regurgitate. Cognitive level number one. Most tertiary institutions, Eduink and a lot of schools, have a nominal pass of 50%. What is the statement in 50%? Half of it you don't know. Half of it you don't know, but we'd like you to be able to engage and use the information. And then a lot of parents say, why does my child need to get 75% if they want an Eduink pass on their report card? What are we saying? as a statement to you as parents and the learners, yes? <laughs> what it's asking you to do is engage with the work and the material and the knowledge and skills at a higher cognitive level, not just about using it, but be able to solve problems with it, to analyze it. This is very lightly, as Gavin has informed me, a Chinese shopping list or Korean or Japanese, I'm not sure. But I'm quite sure, by a show of hands from the learners who looked at some of the recent exams, if that's what it looked like <laughs> when you saw some of the questions. 
What the important thing is here is that if you look at the mark allocation of those down the margin, which questions do you suppose are cognitive level number one? The ones and the twos. Which are cognitive level number two? Possibly the twos, maybe the four. Which ones do you suppose are going to engage the higher cognitive thinking? Yes. So it's likely that if you write the answer yes, it's correct. But you're only going to get one of the marks of the seven because they want you to demonstrate that you can use the information. And I say likely because if anybody's done some multiple choice questions at varsity in third year, you'll know that they can put some very serious cognitive levels in a multiple choice question for one mark. But it's an indication and is indicative of the amount of effort and how you need to engage with the information. So I'm not sure exactly how Gavin put this together, but within this space, his mark allocation was 11 of those marks with cognitive level one, 10 of those marks were cognitive level number two, and nine of those marks were cognitive level number three. We've broken it up into our standard strands within the exam paper. So here's an example. And it might be a little bit oversimplified, but I'm going to walk you through it so that we can understand on a very simple level how this works every day within the classroom. Let's bake a red velvet birthday cake for six people. It's a class activity, so we engage with them at work. Cognitive level number one, let the students are engaging with. Let's make a shopping list. Let's buy the ingredients. Cognitive level number two, the requirements say 50 grams of something, yet the packets they sell are only 20 grams. How many packets do I need? The answer is not two. Okay. Conversions. A lot of recipes have imperial uh, measurement and you have to convert it back to decimal. Then what happens in cognitive level number three is it asks for a round pan, if any, anyone's done any baking, it is 30 centimeters in diameter and exactly seven centimeters deep. You have one that's 25 and is 10 centimeters deep. Or we don't have a round one, we have a square one. But it kind of looks like it's going to fit in there. And we couldn't find the canola oil from some un unknown rainforest that's required in the, the, except if it's a Woolies recipe. So we've had to improvise with something that is oil based that will do the same thing and not alter the, the, the taste of it. We do this all day and every day, don't we? The homework that went home, cut out pictures from old magazines of different cakes used for various celebrations around the world. Parents look at this going, this is insignificant, it's boring, why must they just cut out papers and be researching on the internet? It looks like YouTube time to me. So let's just, ugh, it's not important, go to bed, let's do whatever we need to do. This was the exam question. Describe how you would prepare a blue velvet cake for a Chinese wedding with 20 guests. Were they taught a blue velvet cake for a Chinese wedding in class? Can we use the skills that we've learned in class and a bit of research we're meant to do for homework to answer that question? Do you think this would be worth more marks than the original assessment in the classroom? Absolutely. So the class activity plus the homework will lead us to being able to answer the exam question. So this is put in a nice little box and tied with a bow because it looks nice and easy. It's a little, bit, a little bit more messy usually, but you're getting the picture. So why it's worth more is that suddenly the recipe we had was for a cake, or in this case our butter croissant, but it was for eight and now we have to make 20. So now we have to learn how to use proportion and increase the recipes, the, the ingredients proportionally. Not only that, it said a Chinese wedding cake. So we then had to go and understand what Chinese wedding cakes look like in part of our design and our decorations. That's where the research came in. 
So now we're creating something that we've never done before. Are you all seeing the picture? You all have been there, understanding it. So example two, and this is a real life example. In grade seven, we learn about, not just ducks, we learn about birds. The anatomy of birds and what makes them up and how they are made. We also learn about, not just chameleons, but reptiles. And there may be a class activity which asks you to compare them. What do they have in common and what's unique to them? That's only cognitive level number one. Comparing. We take the facts and see what's the same and what's different. This was the exam question. Compare and contrast the peacock, which is a bird, and the lizard, which is a reptile. Have they learnt about a peacock and a lizard? Have they learned about birds and reptiles? So it's cognitive level number one because it's the comparison. Cognitive level three comes in because now you have to think to use the information in a way that you've never used it before. A bird and a peacock are the same. They do the same thing, even though they look different. So before we go into the second thing you'd wish you'd known sooner, the purpose of explaining the cognitive levels to you, and this is how we teach the students at Eduink from a young age, and the vocabulary starts early, so they understand that a test on the exam is an opportunity to demonstrate your knowledge and skills in a specific way. And if you understand how they want the information, it is easier to give it to you. Does that make sense? The second thing you wish you'd known sooner. It's supposed to be hard, because that's when real learning takes place. So we all know the story, what happens if you help the butterfly or the moth out of its cocoon? It dies, it can't fly. Because part of that struggle, I've heard the, the analogy being used with the chick and an egg, it has to peck its way out of that egg. Because part of that process engages the organs, the heart, the struggle, it increases the heart rate, the blood pressure, it gets the wings unfurling properly. We see that, something struggling, and what do we want to do? We want to help it. How do we help that? You can leave it alone, keep your cats from playing with it, so put it in a safe space where it can get out. Create an environment that's the safest place for that to happen. But don't take it out of the cocoon. So one of the things we talk about in study skills is stress and stress management. Stress is bad. True or false? Hands up for true, hands down for false. Guys, if we weren't stressed, we wouldn't be here, because the cavemen that preceded us would have died during winter, because they wouldn't have had food, they wouldn't have had fire, and they wouldn't have had clothing. So the appropriate amount of stress is good for you. Why? Because it motivates. And as human beings, we will always take the path of least resistance and do nothing if we could. Who would rather spend the entire year on holiday? Not worrying about emails. Not, if you don't put up your hand, you're lying. The thing is that you have to find that golden spot, the Goldilocks area of it, where it's just right. The right amount of stress that brings about the best amount of performance. Too much stress debilitates. Too little stress, we're not motivated. So it's not made difficult for the sake of making it difficult. It's an understanding that true learning only happens when we have to work for it. As Rourke was talking about dopamine levels, when you have succeeded at something difficult, you get a hit, there's a rush. If it's too easy, you kind of think that it was too easy. Is the rush as big? No. It needs to be hard enough to get that dopamine kick so that you can move forward and that you want to do some more work, some more learning. The same thing happens when it comes to your skill and difficulty levels. If 
the child's skill is too low, I can't do it, what do we do? We give up. If it's too difficult, or perceived to be too difficult, we give up. If it's too easy, the child becomes bored. So it's about finding the balance between the skill level and the difficulty level to keep people engaged. So one, one of the things that I really enjoy talking about is J-curves. Who knows what a J-curve is? The baseline of a J-curve is essentially the normal and what we expect to happen and it dips below normal and then it goes through past normal. So this is a nice J-curve and it's probably sitting about there. So when we start a project, and this J-curve for me represents something that I, I feel quite passionate about. Why we always leave things to the last minute and we never have enough time to do it. We overestimate our skill until we really realize what it takes to do the job. And then we've got a lot, of less, a lot less time to upskill ourselves to do the job and then we eventually get there. Some people thrive on that. I think it's creating artificial stress. So we start by going clueless, I don't know what I have to do. And then naively confident. You think you know what you have to do, you still don't really know, but it's fine, I've got this, I have this idea in my head of what I'm going to be doing. Mom, it's sorted, I have an idea, I'm on top of this. Deadline looms, discouragingly realistic. I actually don't know as much as I thought I knew. There's a lot more work to be done. Help crisis, maybe a tantrum, maybe some tears, and that's just from the parents. And then we start and engage on our learning curve, which at this point might be quite a steep one because we've left it so late. This ties into JAX's neuroscience. And if we look at what people are now terming positive frustration, did you know there was such a thing? I sit in the car and I don't think anything positive about the frustration I'm feeling. But in terms of preceding learning, there needs to be some discomfort and frustration, otherwise there's no need for that. We don't find ourselves open to the experience. Where real learning is happening is where we stretch our minds, where our brains are hurting, and we are working in the cognitive level three space where we are taking knowledge from different areas and putting it together. One of the things that your kids, or the kids that are in the audience, are going to do is create their own title that they are going to be performing in this world, their own mission. And part of that is taking knowledge from here and knowledge from there and putting it together. Rook is a classic example, Emma Sadley as well. We are a lawyer and we, know, we understand social media. We now have a whole new job description that wasn't here 15, 10 years ago. So what are you as a parent supposed to do? Who of you feel like this picture on occasion? I would like to claim that I don't know what these pictures mean. <laughs> so who identifies with the tiger mom? You put up your hands, there's no judgment here. Okay. And who identifies as the helicopter parent? Put up your hand, there's no judgment. Thank you. Your job is to create a space and an environment and be supportive of your children's process. Because the process is the most important thing. The results that we get at the end of it are a demonstration of our role in that process and how the kids have engaged in that process. It is frustrating and it's the A-type personalities that just let me do it because you're just not doing it right. And part of what we're teaching our kids is that failure is not okay. It's a very, very important part of the learning process. It can be expensive too. Let's start at the bottom of this page. Suitable work area, healthy meals, regular and sufficient sleep, at school on time and lead by example. You demonstrate control, your kids will sense that control. So what do, parent, what do kids need to be spending their time on? If you divide their time roughly into six parts, one part of their time is for wrote memorizing, it's the push-ups, the times tables, the formulas, the stuff that should just be at the tip of your finger. In the old days, when we didn't have cell phones, it would be memorizing people's telephone numbers. Okay, 
two-thirds of their time doing class activities and textbook activities. That's where cognitive level two is. You may help them with cognitive level one by quizzing them in the car on the way to school. Cognitive level number two is in their class activities and their textbook activities and their appropriate activities for engaging the students and engaging them when they're practicing for tests and exams. And then in preparation for the tests and exams, they should be spending half of their time doing past papers. But there's a special way of doing past papers. We don't just sit down and do the entire paper and then mark it. Because what we've done is spend two hours or three hours practicing the wrong thing. And once you've learned something, to unlearn it takes a lot longer. So what we do is, you find two or three past papers. You start by identifying the similar concepts. Do the first concept, mark it. Is it correct? Yes. Move on to the second paper, same concept. Do it, it's correct. Move on to the third concept, third, or the same concept in the third paper. Got it wrong, fix it. Now I have learnt it properly. If I go all three and then mark, I might have been practicing it incorrectly. And we do that concept by concept. The matrix, I like them to do five or six papers because it gives them the broadest possible scope in how questions are being asked. Once we've done that, and we know that conceptually we understand the work that needs to be done and we're doing it correctly, we then practice for our exam. So then we do the papers from the top. Let me rephrase that. We do the whole paper. Not necessarily from the top to the bottom, but from the easiest to the hardest. Does that make sense, guys? We do it from the easiest to the hardest, but that paper in its entirety. And then we mark it and it's under time conditions. Summer bodies are made in winter. No guilt attached to that. So my question to you after tonight's conversation is how are matric results made? Where are they made? When are they made? Throughout your entire school career. That's me, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much.